The Law of Success, Lesson 14, Failure. You can do it if you believe you can. Under ordinary circumstances, the term failure is a negative term. In this lesson, the word will be given a new meaning, because the word has been a very much misused one. And for that reason, it has brought unnecessary grief and hardship to millions of people. In the outset, let us distinguish between failure and temporary defeat. Let us see that that which is so often looked upon as failure is not in reality, but temporary defeat. Moreover, let us see if this temporary defeat is not usually a blessing in disguise, for the reason that it brings us up with a jerk and redirects our energies along different and more desirable lines. In Lesson 9 of this course, we learned that strength grows out of resistance, and we shall learn in this lesson that sound character is usually the handiwork of reverses and setbacks and temporary defeat, which the uninformed part of the world calls failure. Neither temporary defeat nor adversity amounts to failure in the mind of the person who looks upon it as a teacher that will teach some needed lesson. As a matter of fact, there is a great and lasting lesson in every reverse and in every defeat, and usually it is a lesson that could be learned in no other way than through defeat. Defeat often talks to us in a dumb language that we do not understand. If this were not true, we would not make the same mistakes over and over again without profiting by the lessons that they might teach us. If this were not true, we would observe more closely the mistakes which other people make and profit by them. The main object of this lesson is to help the student understand and profit by this dumb language in which defeat talks to us. Perhaps I can best help you to interpret the meaning of defeat by taking you back over some of my own experiences covering a period of approximately 30 years. Within this period I have come to the turning point, which the uninformed call failure, seven different times. At each of these seven turning points I thought I had made a dismal failure, but now I know that what looked to be a failure was nothing more than a kindly unseen hand that halted me in my chosen course and with great wisdom forced me to redirect my efforts along more advantageous pathways. I arrived at this decision, however, only after I had taken a retrospective view of my experiences and had analyzed them in the light of many years of sober and meditative thought. First Turning Point After finishing a course in business college, I secured a position as stenographer and bookkeeper, which I held for the ensuing five years. As a result of having practiced the habit of performing more work and better work than that for which I was paid, as described in Lesson 9 of this course, I advanced rapidly until I was assuming responsibilities and receiving a salary far out of proportion to my age. I saved my money. My bank account amounted to several thousand dollars. My reputation spread rapidly, and I found competitive bidders for my services. To meet these offers from competitors, my employer advanced me to the position of general manager of the mines where I was employed. I was quickly getting on top of the world, and I knew it. Ah, but that was the sad part of my fate. I knew it. Then the kindly hand of fate reached out and gave me a gentle nudge. My employer lost his fortune, and I lost my position. This was my first real defeat and even though it came about as a result of causes beyond my control, I should have learned a lesson from it, which of course I did, but not until many years later. Second Turning Point My next position was that of sales manager for a large lumber manufacturing concern in the South. I knew nothing about lumber and but little about sales management, but I had learned that it was beneficial to render more service than that for which I was paid and I had also learned that it paid to take the initiative and find out what ought to be done without someone telling me to do it. A good-sized bank account, plus a record of steady advancement in my previous position, gave me all the self-confidence I needed, with some to spare, perhaps. My advancement was rapid, my salary having been increased twice during the first year. I did so well in the management of sales that my employer took me into partnership with him. We began to make money, and I began to see myself on top of the world again. To stand on top of the world gives one a wonderful sensation, but it is a very dangerous place to stand unless one stands very firmly, because the fall is so long and hard if one should stumble. I was succeeding by leaps and bounds. 
Up to that time, it had never occurred to me that success could be measured in terms other than money and authority. Perhaps this was due to the fact that I had more money than I needed and more authority than I could manage safely at that age. Not only was I succeeding from my viewpoint of success, but I knew I was engaged in the one and only business suited to my temperament. Nothing could have induced me to change into another line of endeavor. That is, nothing except that which happened, which forced me to change. The unseen hand of fate allowed me to strut around under the influence of my own vanity until I had commenced to feel my importance. In the light of my more sober years, I now wonder if the unseen hand does not purposely permit us foolish human beings to parade ourselves before our own mirrors of vanity until we come to see how vulgarly we are acting and become ashamed of ourselves. At any rate, I seemed to have a clear track ahead of me. There was plenty of coal in the bunker. There was water in the tank. My hand was on the throttle. I opened it wide and sped along at a rapid pace. Alas, fate awaited me just around the corner with a stuffed club that was not stuffed with cotton. Of course, I did not see the impending crash until it came. Mine was a sad story, but not unlike that which many another might tell if he would be frank with himself. Like a stroke of lightning out of a clear sky, the 1907 panic swept down upon me, and overnight it rendered me an enduring service by destroying my business and relieving me of every dollar that I possessed. This was my first serious defeat. I mistook it then for failure, but it was not, and before I complete this lesson, I will tell you why it was not. Third Turning Point it required the 1907 panic and the defeat that it brought me to divert and redirect my efforts from the lumber business to the study of law. Nothing on earth except defeat could have brought about this result. Thus, the third turning point of my life was ushered in on the wings of that which most people would call failure, which reminds me to state again that every defeat teaches a needed lesson to those who are ready and willing to be taught. When I entered law school, it was with the firm belief that I would emerge doubly prepared to catch up with the end of the rainbow and claim my pot of gold, for I still had no other conception of success except that of money and power. I attended law school at night and worked as an automobile salesman during the day. My sales experience in the lumber business was turned to good advantage. I prospered rapidly, doing so well still featuring the habit of performing more service and better service than that for which I was paid, that the opportunity came to enter the automobile manufacturing business. I saw the need for trained automobile mechanics. Therefore, I opened an educational department in the manufacturing plant and began to train ordinary machinists in automobile assembling and repair work. The school prospered, paying me over a thousand dollars a month in net profits. Again I was beginning to near the end of the rainbow. Again I knew I had at last found my niche in the world's work. That nothing could swerve me from my course or divert my attention from the automobile business. My banker knew that I was prospering, therefore he loaned me money with which to expand. A peculiar trait of bankers, a trait which may be more or less developed in the remainder of us also, is that they will loan us money without any hesitation when we are prosperous. My banker loaned me money until I was hopelessly in his debt. Then he took over my business as calmly as if it had belonged to him, which it did. From the station of a man of affairs who enjoyed an income of more than a thousand dollars a month, I was suddenly reduced to poverty. Now, twenty years later, I thank the hand of fate for this forced change. But at that time I looked upon the change as nothing but failure. The rainbow's end had disappeared, and with it the proverbial pot of gold which is supposed to be found at its end. It was many years afterwards that I learned the truth that this temporary defeat was probably the greatest single blessing that ever came my way, because it forced me out of a business that in no way helped me to develop knowledge of self or of others, and directed my efforts into a channel which brought me a rich experience of which I was in need. For the first time in life I began to ask myself if it were not possible for one to find something of value other than money and power at the rainbow's end. This temporary questioning attitude did not amount to open rebellion, mind you, nor did I follow it far enough to get the answer. It merely came as a fleeting thought, as do so many other thoughts to which we pay no attention, and passed out of my mind. Had I known as much then as I now know about the law of compensation, 
and had I been able to interpret experiences as I can now interpret them, I would have recognized that event as a gentle nudge from the hand of fate. After putting up the hardest fight of my life up to that time, I accepted my temporary defeat as failure, and thus was ushered in my next and fourth turning point, which gave me an opportunity to put into use the knowledge of law that I had acquired.